Has Christianity always been one of the religions in the world to you? Oh, hallelujah. Christianity is not a religion. Neither is it a joining of a church and doing the Christian things like praying and giving and so on. Hallelujah. Christianity is the outworking of God's own kind of life received into the spirit of a man. Whoa! This divine life in the heart of a man makes him righteous, keeps him healthy, divinely guarded in life, prosperous and victorious. It gives you the ability to enjoy intimate fellowship with the Father and have dominion on this earth. Hallelujah! This is what awaits you if you will wholeheartedly believe that Jesus is the Son of God raised from the dead and personally confess him as the Lord of your life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Join Dr. David Binder on the Good Life Devotion every Monday to Friday on this channel and receive truth that will usher you into the Good Life experience. Wow, wow, wow. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm sure you've been itching to get connected today. And I've also been waiting to be connected to you today. Welcome to today's special episode of your favorite Great Devotion. This is your center for biblically authoritative teachings where you receive the truth of God's word to make you that amazing personality in Christ that God made you to be. The Gula Devotion is God's voice for the nations of the earth in these final days of the church to ripen the church for the coming of our dear Lord Jesus and effect the greatest soul harvest into the kingdom. This is why if you have found a good devotion, this is of God. Be part of it. How? Pray into it every day, recommend it to others regularly, and pay to get it to another media platform. And your life will never be the same. Hallelujah. This has been an awesome week. We've been dealing with the subject of the reality of righteous living. And we began by making you know that it doesn't matter how permissive and perverse and crooked the society has become. You must know that it is possible or living righteously is real. It's something that can be done. It is not one of the Christian utopian ideals that is not possible. You know, it's like as if something people just talk about but they know that it's not possible. No, that is not one. To live a righteous life is real. You can't. And in fact, you should be if you're born again. And we said, look at Noah. Even in the days of just being a natural man, despite that the whole generation was sinful, God found him righteous. If it was possible, then how about now that you are born again and filled with the Holy Ghost? It should be much easier. All you need to do is that don't follow the many who are saying that, oh, because they are living in this body, they will sin. Oh, they are all sinners. No. And it's, oh, because they are all humans. You are not. If you are born again, you were harvested from the human species. You are no more human. You were born of God. And being born of God, righteousness is your realm. You must know it. The realm of a fish is water. The realm of a dog is land. The realm of the born again is righteousness. So, don't have this mentality when we say we are righteous. We think that it's blasphemous or braggadocious or, I mean, um, uh, just trying to pretend. There's nothing wrong with a dog saying I'm a barker. Nothing wrong with a fish saying I'm a swimmer. But if you are thinking human, for human, it is impossible to be righteous. But don't transfer that humanistic thinking and state for sons of God. So if you are a son of God, stop living at the side of the humans. Move to the side of the divine. And you realize that the issue of sin and holiness, and they are not difficult matters. They are your natural realm. And so the Lord began taking us on this journey. And he's showing us much more about sin. So that people... Learn to know much about it and the tricks around it so that you don't stay in that region. So first, he showed us that a certain way people are living this day that they call uh, modernized Christianity or fashionable Christianity is bondage to sin. Then he moved us to look at the danger of living in sin. It means that you are going to forfeit all the great things the Lord has for you. Spiritual things. Because the moment you, you live against God's instructions, You've broken the foundation of righteous living. Today we are going to move forward and we're going to take a look at what makes people sin. See, all these things we are teaching is to let you know the other side so that you can see why you should flip to the other side. Because with all we are teaching you, if you get these things flashed out of your system, what will be left is righteous living. 
But if you don't get these wrong things flashed out of your system, they will be the very things that will keep you in the humanistic region of sin when you could have lived freely in the divine region of righteousness. So what makes people sin? We can share the word of prayer as we begin for today. Father, we love you. We bless you that we are born again and we are born righteous. We are born with the ability to do right. And as we are learning these things, erroneous mentalities are washed off and we step into righteous living in Jesus' name. Amen. Our main scripture today is 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46. 1 Kings 8, 46. This was, again, Solomon praying in the period of dedicating the temple. And look what he said. He says, And if they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy, far or near. He was here to complete the prayer in verse 47. But our emphasis is in this 47. That's why I read that. It says that if they sin against thee, then he put into bracket, for there is no man that sinned not. And thou be angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy, far or near. Which means that, like I said in the previous episode, if they did not live in the word of God, they'll be delivered into the other word. The, in the olden day, what happened is the presence of God will be withdrawn and they become victims to their enemy. That's what happened to them. Okay. But let me just go on slowly so that you get something here. By way of introduction, we said that some people just cannot live a day without committing sinful acts. It's like it's food they eat. It's like sin is like the, the river in which they swim. And when we who are living in righteousness, we look at them from the position of righteousness, we wonder what is the issue with them. Because if you look at what it means to be born again, to become inseparably one with the Holy Spirit, my God, to be a partaker of the divine nature, more with the full enablement of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, that same spirit will quicken your mortal body. A life in which the indwelling Holy Ghost has vitalized our mortal bodies. So that we are no more debtors to the flesh, to do according to the flesh. But through the spirit, we mortify the transactions of the flesh. If you look at it from this side, you wonder what's wrong with these other guys. But for them, it's like, that's life. Question is, what makes them sin? When they are born again, full of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, sometimes even preaching, doing many things in the house of God, what makes them continue to sin? I'll show you. Are you ready? Let me tell you something I learned from uh, Solomon. I put it here in the Mass Peter. If you have it, you'll get it. The reason why many people are God's people continue to commit acts of sin even though they are not sinners. I wondered until I discovered something from King Solomon. I was reading 1 Kings chapter 8 and I was reading the way Solomon prayed to dedicate the temple. Maybe I should take my time and read a few more verses before we come to verse 46 so that you can understand. 1 Kings, shout I love my Bible, glory. 1 Kings chapter 8, I will take it from verse 33. King Solomon started praying. Um, and then from verse 33, he started saying something. He said that, when thy, when thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house. He was trying to say that when they do that, hear their prayer. Go to verse 35. When heaven is shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, 
if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin, when thou afflicted them, then they will say, hear our prayer. Verse 37. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blastings, mildew, locust, or if there be caterpillar, if there be, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, then he talk about how God will listen to them. And you can note something from this verse 33, verse 35, and if you read all the way down to verse 46, he kept on saying something. First of all, if the people are smitten, why? Because they sin against you. And they pray, hear them. Second, if the heaven shut up, there's no rain, because the people have sinned against you. And they turn, hear them. King Solomon, you built a temple. And you are dedicating the temple. Why were your prayers based on the fact that if they sin, and this happens, and they turn and pray, if they sin, why were you praying into the future of Israel thinking that they'll be sinning and sinning and sinning? I don't know why you're getting this, the thing I got. What's the lesson? So, I kept on wondering, why is Solomon praying this way? Then I landed on the verse 46, which we read. He was praying there and he, he said, and if they sin against thee, then he, he said, for there is no man that sinned not. <laughs> For there is no man that's there not. So when I got there, then the Lord made me pause. And he said, this was his thinking pattern. In the mind of King Solomon, there is no man that sinned not. Therefore, he knew that by all means, Israel will sin. And so that's how he prayed. If they sin and this happens and they turn, hear them. If they sin and that happens and they turn, hear them. So it's like Solomon was programmed for, I will sin. But if I turn, God hear me. I will sin, but if I attend, hear me. Then the Lord ministered to me why Solomon's heart was finally taken away from God. This is how come Solomon finally sinned. Because this was his mentality. For there is no man that sinned not. This was not the way his father David taught. His father David prayed. And told the Lord that keep me from sinning. David knew it was possible to be kept from sinning if he was kept by God in the Old Testament. But Solomon thought that, oh, there's no man that sinned not. All you just need to do is if you sin, you, you come to God and turn, and God will forgive you. And there are those who have accepted that kind of life. So when they hear God is merciful, is a dispensation of grace, they love it. Why? God, they know that we'll, we'll sin. But when we sin, let's come and confess our sins and God will forgive us. They, they like that kind of living. But there is a better place. It's like somebody choosing that, oh, when, when I'm sick, I want this person to pray for me. Why do you want to live in the sick and heal, sick and heal? Why can't you step into divine health? Are you following this? So, it's a personal lesson from King Solomon. You realize that King Solomon had a particular way of thinking about sin and he had a conclusion about man that there's no one that's sin and not. And today, there are people still thinking this way. There's no man that's sin and not. Of course, if it is a man, it's possible. But even being a man, it was possible that if you walked with God, you will not live in sin. Listen, God will not tell you to live righteous when he knows that you can't. Why would God tell them that if you don't keep my laws, I'll do this? He knew it was possible for them to keep it. But they had this mentality that as men, they will sin. That was the reason they kept sinning. Not because they were not people of God. So, from that lesson, if we ask the same question today, what makes people sin? Especially people who are sons of God. What makes them sin? What makes them continue to sin? It is because of certain important facts which I'll be pulling out of this lesson when I return after this short break. So don't worry, we'll be right back after this break. Do you have a copy of this month's Emancipator? The Emancipator is a tool by which millions will receive truth and be born again. The entire body of Christ 
will come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to live as icons of Christ. Call 0249-293688 to order for your hard copies today or visit finalglobalmovement.org to download a free soft copy. Praise God. Hallelujah. So listen carefully. Living a righteous life is real. It is possible. But why are many unable to live that life? It is not because sin is so powerful. It is not because they cannot live that life. It is because of a certain state of their life. Like the King Solomon state. If you have this thing in mind that it is not possible not to sin, you always live in bondage to sin. Three main things that make people sin. I mentioned them to you when I was showing you the features of living in bondage to sin. But here, I want you to appreciate. So those who are in bondage to sin have those features and those are the features that make them sin. Number one is the feeling that they cannot do anything about sin. This is what makes people sin. I'm telling you truth. People who feel that they cannot do anything about a particular sin or sin, they will continue to commit acts of sin. It doesn't matter how they try to paint themselves holy. But the day it dawns on them that they can live as masters of a sin, it changes the whole story. That's why I wrote the book, Master of a Sin. Get a copy of that book. So, what makes people sin? What makes uh, even Christians sin? One, they have this feeling that they cannot do anything about sin. That's what makes them sin. Number two, they think everyone sins and therefore it is okay to, to sin. You see, they think everyone sins. So they think, okay, if everyone is sinning, if I have also sinned, that's okay. That thinking that everyone sins is their problem. That's why they keep on sinning. Because if everyone is sinning, then you are not going to think you are going to be different. But the day it dawns on you that those who have understood the message of righteousness are not sinning, you will, you will break camp and advance. You will move your camp from everyone's sins to we are righteous. May that camp be changed in your life. May you break camp from everyone's sins and move to the camp of we are righteous. Even as you receive the truth of God's word. Oh, hallelujah. Number three. Why do people sin? They live in expectation that it will happen. They live in expectation that it will happen. Look at King Solomon. You had opportunity to dedicate a temple. And look at the prayer. If this happens because they have sinned and they turn and pray, forgive. If that happens because they have sinned, it's not like the, the thing, he thought the things could happen naturally. He knew that the things could not happen if they didn't sin. And he finally said, no man, there's no one without sin. So, if you are somebody that these things are true in you, you may not have told your friend or somebody but the Holy Ghost knows your thoughts. That's why he's making me to share this. If any of this is true, I can tell you, you continue to commit acts of sin until your mind is washed off these things. And I'm going to show you in the next one or two episodes how you can break out of this thing. Number one, people continue to commit sin because they feel they cannot do anything about it. It's like somebody, like that person I said, called and said, oh, oh, I'm married, but I just cannot stop having affairs with other women. And for him, it's like he's done everything and it's not stopping. Such a person comes to a place that he believes that, oh, this thing cannot stop. The moment you get to that place, it's like the devil has organized a party to celebrate about you and put you in your, his armpit. You can't come out. You will continue to do it because you feel helpless. Number two, they're thinking that, oh, everyone sins. Just that, say, we don't, I don't, you know, they hide to do that thing. So they think someone else is also hiding. So why everybody is working on the so we have all polished and we have covered and we go back to our hiding place, then we all know what we do. It's not like that. 
Elijah thought he was the only prophet. God said, I have 7,000 people who have not bowed to bow. Don't be deceived. We may all be walking about. But Bible said, the foundation of the Lord stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth those who are his. The Lord knows those who are living righteously because they have understood who they are in Christ. And in fact, if you know who you are in Christ, it's not about struggling not to sin. It's about being who you are. You see, that's something. If you find yourself struggling not to sin, you can't. But if you find yourself just being who you are, easy. That is why the teaching of who we are in Christ is what the church needs. If you know who you are and you just be, you will not struggle. But if you are struggling, it means you are not being and struggling cannot achieve the results. Then number three, why do they commit sins? They live in expectation of sins. They know it will happen. There are some people who are actually expecting it to an extent that they, they've actually started enjoying the sin. They know that it will happen. So if it happens, so at least for the past one year, it hasn't happened. So if this once has happened, that's okay. I'm improving. <laughs> oh, praise God. Why did the Lord show you this? So that you can know where you can allow the word of God to wash your mind. That you can be well positioned in who you are. We conclude by saying that if you flash these things out of your life, you'll be amazed at how easy it is to live a righteous life. I cannot say it any better than this. If you are able to come to understand that I can do something about sin, and number two, you take away the thinking that everybody sins and know that there are people who are righteous and I can be one of them. And then number three, you can't know that, look, it is not by force that I should sin in the future. I can live without sin. If you get, if you get your mind this way, in other words, if you flash what I mentioned earlier out of your mind and you keep these latter ones, you realize that it is easy to live a righteous life. Oh, praise God. Praise God. So, if someone is so, we are all sinners, and I want to stop and I can't stop, one of these is true about him or her. These are the three main reasons why people continue to sin. If they flag these things out of their system, sin will become a thing of the past. They will be surprised if they commit acts of sin. And this is how a child of God is supposed to live. A child of God should live in righteousness so much that if you ever commit an act of sin or a blunder, you are surprised. That's why sin becomes an if. That's it. I write these things to you so that you sin not. But if any sins, it's not a when for you. Because that's not your natural way of living. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. There's a confession here I want us to make before we round up. Say with me, by my oneness with the Holy Spirit. Wrong perspectives about sin are flashed out of me. And I live in righteousness with ease. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. Wow. So do go over these messages. We are going to get them posted on our YouTube channel. Get them, make notes and keep them in your archives and watch them until you share your testimony of how you have lived or you are living over that act that used to keep you in bondage. Wow. This is our permit us for today. If you have been watching me and you have not yet received the Lord Jesus, it doesn't matter how much you desire to live holy or righteous and all that. As long as you are not born again, forget it. No human can live a righteous life. That is why Jesus came. Only those who are born again can live righteous because they have the nature of righteousness. The one who is not born again still has the corrupted human life in him which has no power to stand before sin. That's why in Romans 7, a person under that state said, what? the good that I want to do, I do not. The evil that I want to do, that's what I do. Why? I'm sold as a slave under sin. That is the experience of mankind. But when you get born again, you come out as a new creature, a master over sin, over whom the Bible says that sin shall no more have dominion over you. Glory to God. Do you want to be born again today? And it's not just because you want to come out of sin, because it is God's plan for your life that as one born as human, there should be a day that you receive Jesus and be born again as a son of God. What does it take? 
Believe with all your heart that Jesus came to this world and died and rose again. And by that resurrection, he made the life of God available for everyone. And if you believe and acknowledge his lordship, you will receive that life into your spirit and you'll be begotten as a son of God. If you want to be born again, do you believe he died and rose again? Do you believe eternal life is available? Then declare his lordship after me by saying this. Say, Jesus, I now know that by your death and resurrection, eternal life is available for me. I receive eternal life into my spirit now. As I declare with all my heart that Jesus is Lord. Wow, if you have done this with all your heart, boy, you are born again. Ensure that you continue to follow us regularly to receive truth that will build you up in Christ. And do what? Get planted in a Bible teaching and a Bible practicing church and remain in Christ till he comes. Because Christ is going to come very soon. Till I meet you in our next episode as we look at how to round up on this subject. Life is good. Enjoy. Thank you for joining today's episode of your favorite Good Life Devotion with Dr. David Bender. The Good Life Devotion is proudly brought to you by friends and partners of the Final Global Movement. For more information on how to become a partner, call us on 055-792-7744 or log on to our website, finalglobalmovement.org. Become a partner today and contribute to the global spread of God's message for the now. Follow us on our various social media handles and you will be blessed. Don't miss the Good Life Devotion on the channels displayed on your screen at the scheduled times. Till we come your way with the next episode of the Good Life Devotion with Dr. David Bender. Life is good. Enjoy.